Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Jen Bender with the Build Initiative, and I'm handling the logistics on today's call. Today's webinar will be broadcast through your computer speakers. Please make sure that your speakers are turned to a comfortable volume. If you have questions or comments during the session, please type them into the chat box. Please note that other participants will not see your questions in the chat box, so our presenters will read and respond to them as we have time during the call. This webinar is being recorded. Follow, following the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the webinar recording, PowerPoint slides, and additional resources. I'm now going to turn the webinar over to Sherry Killen-Stewart. Thank you so much, Jen. Hi, this is Sherry Killen-Stewart with the BUILD Initiative, and I'm so excited to be here today with my partners from around the country, New Orleans, Denver, Las Vegas, and the Bezos Family Foundation. Uh, we welcome you and we look forward to input. We really want this to be interactive, so there are lots of folks on the line, and we appreciate your interest, but using the chat box is the best way to get us questions as we're going through. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron um, Ramsey to tell you a little bit more about who's participating today. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sherry, and thanks, Jen. Uh, we're so excited. I have the, the privilege of kind of introducing the lineup on the webinar today. And the Bezos Family Foundation is really appreciative of BUILD and us bringing our work together, hopefully to give you some really great practical ideas in um, building early childhood systems and collaborations in your communities. So Sherry's going to start off with an overview of the toolkit that BUILD and all of her partners created. And she'll be followed by Danielle Milam from Las Vegas Clark County Libraries. And she's going to talk about their new uh, collective action uh, slash impact campaign called Raising Las Vegas and really talk about how systems can come together around early childhood with the library as the lead. Ellen Galinsky, the Senior um, Research Adv uh, Executive Director of Mind the Making and the Senior Research Advisor for the Bezos Family Foundation, will give an overview of the research on executive function and the life skills and do an overview of how we are bringing that um, research into action into communities and sectors. And then she'll be followed by Sarah Brenkamp from Breakert from uh, Denver Children's Museum. She's the Director of Evaluation and Education. And then followed with Julia Bland, the CEO of the Louisiana Children's Museum. And she'll be talking about how she's embedded the research into programs that they're already doing. So I'm going to turn it back to Sherry. And we're so glad everybody's going to be a part of this with us. Thank you so much, Erin. And like the lineup that we have for you today of museums and libraries, the Bezos Foundation and the BUILD Initiative, the work that the BUILD Initiative did working with libraries and museums, really making what libraries and museums and early childhood systems do visible to each other, was funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Science through a cooperative agreement. They had done a report called Growing Young Minds, and they discovered that in many instances, libraries and museums were not right at the cornerstone of the early childhood development that was happening in states and wanted us to work with them to learn more about it. And so as we get started, we're curious to know who actually is on the call with us today. If you could um, use your computer and tell us what sector do you primarily represent? It'll give us a little bit of an idea of who we're talking um, with today. Because as we talk, we're going to talk about the importance and the significance of all of these roles in building an early childhood system and supporting young children. Okay. So, you can keep voting, but it looks like about 60% of people identify themselves as early learning um, and about 20% libraries and museums. And I imagine we should have split, it, split that question up, but excited um, to see a quarter of the folks coming from that area. If you come from another um, area and you selected other, it's helpful if you could put it in the chat box so that as we go back and look at this webinar, we will be able to get a sense of, of what you represent. There are some people from health, and we always want to see that increase and family support. 
And this is significant because at BUILD, we work with leaders around building early childhood systems. That early childhood system we define as including health, early learning, family support. Um, of course, there are other influencer social services. We recognize that young children birth to eight or birth to five really develop in the context of their family and strong communities and have lots of support that they get from both community and the state. And I'm curious if any of you participate in a state or local level early childhood system. So that could be a committee that includes people from early learning. That could be a formal committee that really has early learning and family support. But give us a sense. Are you working at the local level? Are you working at the state level? Or not yet engaged in any sort of formal infrastructure or practice? Because as we go through and talk about this work with libraries, museums, and early childhood systems, and Ellen gives you some examples, and you hear from our colleagues from around the country, the idea is that we really want to support you to be thinking holistically about the development of young children and their families. And so this is great. We've got about 48, almost 50% of folks coming from the local level. We have about 43% that are coming um, from the state level and about 8% of you that we want to know by name so that we can help you get connected to either your state or local level early childhood system. Um, the BUILD and IMLS partnership uh, was created to make sure that really embedded the connections across libraries and early childhood systems in a way that they could be replicated and sustained. When we were doing this work, we found that often libraries or museums or the early childhood system had a partnership, but it was related to a specific grant opportunity when, when resources were available, or it was linked to a specific institution, say a Head Start program where you could connect and have go ongoing activities. And we really wanted to find spaces and places and reasons for individuals to come together that could be replicated and sustained so when a funding opportunity or an opportunity to work together came upon you, you already had that table. So we had some project goals around strengthening outcomes for children and families and helping to address inequities so that we reach children and families that don't typically have access to high quality development and learning opportunities. As we learned um, from the states, and I'll share those in a second, that we worked with, often there are pockets of children and families that actually don't feel they have access to libraries and museums and may not be participating in early childhood systems. So we worked with leaders, libraries, museums, and early childhood systems in Arizona and Georgia, Michigan and Pennsylvania and Washington, and I will say that they're all different and had different ways of approaching it. What stayed steady was that they were museum, library, and early childhood program and service leaders to really create a toolkit that's available to you now online to help build those partnerships. And that could be a new partnership or that could be a partnership that people but want to take advantage of the formal and informal activities that are happening in your community. Your museums and libraries are really anchor institutions and can really support states in their efforts to build early childhood systems and increase access to high quality opportunities. We really wanted libraries and museums to be seen as a critical part of the early childhood system. So we all share a set of goals. We want the children, um, we recognize that children live in and are shaped by their families and communities. And we all recognize together that children grow and develop across multiple domains. I uh, heard a lot from museum leaders about their different approach. Um, libraries and museums often talked about their space as being a no-fail zone, that both parents and families could come in and learn together. That libraries and museums reach millions of children and are often already seen as a trusted institution and that quality early childhood programs are also providing critical development. And so there was much the partnership had in common. Um, the focus on the science of child development, we now know the importance of those early years across multiple domains, 
that was a language, that was a science that we all shared, while what we did with that information may be different. We all had access to children and families. We had many and varied ways of serving, some more episodic, some one-time events, some multiple events over time, some enrolled in a program where parents and children came every day, but we each had a way of providing high-quality opportunities to children and families, and all of those were important. We all had multiple funding streams, and sometimes they were federal, and all with a single goal of making sure that children and families and communities had the opportunity for high-quality growth and development. One system leader said, it's really easy for us to partner with other established institutions. It's harder for us to do this thing one at a time. But with partners, if we create a message across museums and libraries, early childhood systems, we could help families see all of us as resources in supporting their children's growth and development. So we wanted to be intentional in expanding the number of formal and informal learning opportunities for families. If one opportunity, a lot of libraries and museums go out of their space, bring things into the community, we wanted to extend those to new children and families that might not have the opportunity. We recognize that some of our institutions actually sit right outside of the communities that need or may need our services the most, and we had to do more to learn about where those communities were and sometimes partner to really have access and spaces to do things. We learned about science museums that had exhibits that they would take out, that they needed a community-based partner in order to have a place to bring those activities. Reaching families that don't typically have access to these developmental and learning experiences was a high priority of creating these partnerships. Another quote, keeping equity as a focus was critical to her work. As we worked together, she recognized that equal access was not enough if you really wanted to make sure that families, all families really had access to equitable opportunities. And so that she may have to do more than just having the doors open but not looking at the demographics, not looking at the data about who's coming in and not coming in may not actually be leading to the equal access she thought she had. We had libraries and museums talk about putting passes at the library, but then when they look at the zip codes of who was coming, it was still not really representative of their state. And so another reason why the partnership could help folks grow and move forward. So the resources were used to develop new partnerships or to build um, existing partnerships. Sometimes libraries and museums together, sometimes museums and early childhood systems. What we were stretching for is museums, libraries, and early childhood systems working together, recognizing that everybody was busy. Um, certainly we heard that as well, that leadership was key as well as infrastructure. And so someone taking the lead, often in partnership, was key to the success of moving these ideas forward. Um, the CM leader said, you know, we know families want to do what's best for their children, but some don't have an extra 15 minutes a day. So how do we take the high-quality things that are going on in our museums and in our libraries and make those available to families? That was something that individuals felt they could work on together. So here's the toolkit or a thumbnail of the toolkit. After working with those five states and working with those leaders over a year, we recognized that with three buckets that we needed to want it to support people to continue to work on. One is the development of shared relationships and interests. The second is really about articulating the opportunities for shared benefit. And the third was really designing implementation and assessing um, the action plans that were developed. So in part one, we focused on relationships and shared interests. You know, what is our shared definition of communities? Um, you all know many museums, especially science and some children's museums, really have a regional footprint versus a neighborhood footprint where a library is going to have a very distinct, often, neighborhood footprint. 
So what do we mean when we say community? Who are we serving and who aren't we serving? And lots of challenges we explored around data and data sharing or the inability to do that. Who's at our table when we decide to do an activity? And how do we get an authentic voice of family, not just those folks who are coming to any of our institutions, but maybe those individuals who are not coming to our individuals, our institutions, I'm sorry. In part two, we wanted to understand and articulate opportunities for shared benefit. What is the demographic profile of our community? Do we have the data we need for planning? And if we don't, is that something the early childhood state system can help us with or mayors or other local institutions? What strategies do we already have in place that are right for expansion or that people aren't fully taking advantage of? And if we had new partners, we could increase the uptake. Um, both libraries and museums both want and desire to continue to expand the individuals that are coming to their doors. And how do we measure our impact if we choose to work together? In part three, we talked about the design and implementation. So you've got your partnership, you know who your community is, you know what you're partnering around. Is there something that we can do together that we can't do individually? Do we have model programs and services? It often came up that in the early childhood system, they wanted to do STEAM or STEM. And the Science Museum had already created toolkits that could be retrofitted and made available to the early childhood community. So it often wasn't about a new idea or a new program. It was about figuring out how to spread, share, replicate, and expand. How do we make sure that we're getting authentic family input as we think about equity and who's approaching us and who's not? And again, how do we understand and measure success? This is a quote from our early um, childhood systems leaders that, look, we're all facing the same challenges, transportation, language barriers with families meeting multiple, um, speaking multiple languages, um, families that aren't comfortable coming to our programs. We can learn a lot from each other about how to both make families feel welcome and how to do our daily work. So you'll find in the toolkit lots of um, quick tools that you can use for planning meetings and planning gatherings that support each of the phases of the work that I've described. We had a literacy coordinator said that they were working um, in a project called Read On, and they had hundreds of organizations that were already using these the libraries, early learning, and engage more families. We heard the partnerships were valuable. Um, teams made lots of new connections. So again, this isn't about the first dollar in. It's about building the relationships so that when dollars and when opportunities are available, you already know who to call. These are quotes from the participation that it strengthened relationships, that it brought people together who may not have been involved um, at, another, at another point. And there were lots of promising strategies around leveraging existing systems, standards, and networks. You know that the early childhood system across the country has built what they call early learning guidelines. And libraries and museums alike said, that's often a very dense document, but how do we make that accessible to our librarians who may be very stretched? Or how do we think about labeling things in our museums as the Boston Children's Museum does so that it aligns with those early learning standards so that families see the benefit that this isn't an event they're going on, but this is a part of the learning. And so coming back over and over really does build the skills in children. They talked about building intentional strategies to gather to market and think about reaching families at the same time. They also talked about strategies for reaching certain neighborhoods and zones, places that um, were either under-resourced or when they looked at the data, they were not reaching either through libraries, museums, or effectively with early childhood systems. And another idea that came up in Pennsylvania um, had already been doing this and really took it to heart was this idea of joint professional development that often librarians have things that they know that they're willing to share with early child, the early childhood field, but often they're librarians who have adult librarians and need to learn more about child development. 
that can also happen in the museum space. And so there were lots of conversations around professional development. What do I have I can share and what do you have you can share? And the best case scenario is when at the local level we're all learning together. And I think you're going to hear later in this presentation from Ellen and others about how that can be an opportunity. Aaron, I don't know, you're checking the chat box. Are there questions there at this point, or we can move on to Danielle? You have a couple minutes no, if you've got a question. Sure. If someone wants to punch in a question, they can. If not, um, we'll just reiterate that the PowerPoint will be sent out to everybody. If you feel like you're not capturing everything, you'll have the resources afterwards. And other than that, I think we're ready to go on to Danielle Sherry. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Sherry, for uh, queuing up this discussion. And uh, my name is Danielle Milam. I'm the Director of Development and Planning at the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. I had the great fortune to get uh, one of our state grants that comes in from our federal agency, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, that is part of this initiative with BUILD. And um, over the last year, we had been in a, a planning grant phase to look at how we could create a collective action um, initiative, agenda, um, uh, sort of combined resources of a lot of different partners who have been apparently sitting in, in rooms together for many decades but haven't really thought about how we could better align our resources together to get to a, a really big challenge here in, in the Vegas Valley. Um, when the library received the grant, we started meeting monthly with about six organizations, and by the end of that year, that planning grant year, we were meeting with 15 organizations, um, some also even at the state level, but many uh, direct service providers to young children here in the Vegas Valley. And um, one thing that we found was that they had been sitting in rooms sort of talking about you know, what they did well as individual organizations, but they hadn't really taken the time, as Sherry was indicating, to, to take a look at the community data and figure out what is the bigger challenge that everybody's really trying to get at. Where and can we align our different organizational strategies better and more effectively to get to a larger regional plan where um, maybe altogether we can start to measure some impact over time. So when the organizations uh, got together, the library district had done quite a bit of work on uh, analyzing the community. And the one thing that we found was about 75 per – well, first of all, I guess a bit of a surprise for Vegas Valley is that we're all a bunch of um, families that live here. About 75% of our service area is family households. And out of those, um, about 133,000 uh, of those family households have kids uh, between zero and five. And what we found out is about 75% of those had children that were living in uh, what we would call under-resourced households. So we were, um, you know, households basically making less than 30,000, but all working families. So these families were are working our 24-7 sort of hospitality and construction worker um, shifts, and they had some very particular needs that weren't being felt, um, weren't being filled primarily just getting access to child care and early childhood programs when you're a shift worker and you lack transportation and you, your life, you're running the So the ultimate thing that the club uh, Las Vegas into was, um, you know, who's in child care and who, who doesn't have access to child care. And we basically identified about 75% of our kiddos aren't in any kind of formal care at all. But our partners, um, together, we started looking could we reach out to that community. And the Raising Las Vegas um, Collective Action Team, really just by working together and, and starting to understand that we're all out after the same agenda, uh, we've seen some pretty amazing um, initiatives launch in just a year's time just by sharing experience, having the great opportunity to get trained by Aaron Ramsey um, with the Mind in the Making training, making the connection with the Bezos Foundation on the Vroom application for uh, parenting tips that we can push out both in English and Spanish to our community. And um, 
and start to work with each other in very, very different ways. Our Vegas PBS partner, for example, really took the lead in tr- doing a soft launch of the Vroom um, sort of short um, uh, PSAs right in advance of some of the popular programs here on PBS, uh, like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Uh, we started working with the Southern Health District. We had never really worked with them before, but they had the Nurse Family Partnership in place to reach a lot of very vulnerable families, either first-time teen moms or uh, African-American families that were in high risk of infant mortality. And, um, and then we found probably three major players in town who were receiving the federal monies for subsidized child care. And we actually helped each other understand better what the, what, what the challenge is and what we need to design to if we really want to make a difference. For example, we found that um, only 30% of the kids are in child care, and, but, a, but a, a very small percentage are in, in these centers because the centers really don't have the hours that the families need. And we discovered an entire large sector of what they call family, friend, and neighbor care. Uh, providers. And so now the library wants to work for development to see if we can't grow that sector of family, friend, and neighbor care that provides, you know, those off hours, the longer hours, and make sure that those care providers understand um, the wonderful research-based pr- principles behind Broom and behind MITM. Um, I think we're all looking forward to doing a larger launch together this spring in conjunction with the uh, Week of the Child in March, where we want to bring down and do a hard launch around the Broom um, parenting app. We're really excited about that being sort of the first touch, Uh, but also understanding that given our demographics and our particular community challenge, that we won't reach all those families through that particular initiative. So we want to make sure that we are cross-training across our organizations uh, on the mind in the making and making sure that whether you're the Discovery Children's Museum or the United Way that's working with daycares or the Urban League that's working with Head Start, uh, that, that the library is uh, both a trainer and a place for finding those, um, those state-of-the-art approaches to early childhood care and training. And in some, I think that's, that's sort of where we are right now. It's a, it's a startup. It's a kickoff. We don't even have our logo for Raising Las Vegas. Um, but we're working on all of those things so that we can establish for our community a unified sort of umbrella where all of these organizations that are doing great things for the early childhood ecosystem here in the Vegas Valley, we can work together. We can find the new resources we need. And for the most part already, we are doing so much more with the resources we, uh, that we already have, that's the existing resources, but we're working differently because we're working together. Thank you so much, Danielle. I really appreciate that. And so here's another question, it's similar to an earlier one, but are you working across sectors with other early childhood efforts? Because that's the point of the toolkit, and I think it's the point that Danielle just made. In fact, you know, her phrase, which is one most people don't like, is we're actually doing better with the resources we already have for the fact that we came together. So it looks like we may be preaching to the choir a little bit, and that's great. Um, About 90% of you are doing it, and thank you, Margaret, but we can do more. I appreciate that. Sentiment and six of you aren't six about, and so we want to, of course, make ourselves a resource to you as you think that through. And so now I have the pleasure of turning the presentation over to Ellen Galinsky, who's got a long history um, in this field. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you so much. Um, um, as um, Aaron said, I'm the Chief Science Officer at the Bezos Family Foundation, so I'd like to share with you the journey that we've been on, what we've found, and what we've done with what we've found. Um, We began with a question, which is um, how do we keep the engagement that children are born with, the engagement in learning, high? Because we found through studies that we're we're doing of school-aged children that too many children were not just dropping out of school, but were dropping out of learning. So we turned to the science to um, 
look for answers. Um, and this was in 2000, 2001. So we have a 17-year journey uh, that we've been on. And the, one of the first things we found is the importance of um, the early years. Now that's kind of a duff finding right now, but um, when we began looking, uh, it wasn't that wasn't so clear. People thought, and and actually a, a survey recently found um, that pe that people thought that children didn't begin learning until they got to school. Um, but actually, those uh, if you think building a house. Uh, the architecture of the brain is built from the ground up, but it's very uh, it 's never too late. There used to be a debate about is it nature is it nurture um, the experiences we have right on the genes that we 're born with. Um, the second thing is um, I like to call this uh, it's relationship stupid i don 't remember what, whether you all remember the debate in uh, uh, several presidential elections ago, but it was the economy stupid. Um, well, everything in child development leads to the importance of the relationship um, and that we don't learn without relationships. In fact, there is no development without relationships. And that's a relationship not just with parents, but with all the kids, who, uh, the caregivers who are important in children's lives um, in schools and family child care, in friend family, friend, and neighbor care, and in museums and libraries, home visiting, and so forth. Um, but that relationship um, depends on um, something. Uh, it depends on that back and forth. Um, so many campaigns, if you think about reading, it's read to children. No, it's the back and forth um, relationship that really makes a difference. You can call it serve and return. You can call it a dance. You can, Yuri Bronfenbrenner called it a ping pong game. Um, you can call it a conversational duet, which is what Kathy Hirsch Pasek calls it. But it's the back and forthness of the relationship where the adult is building on and extending what the child is learning. That's an essential strategy. And um, it's really well illustrated by a study uh, that Patricia Kuhl did. Um, she took 11-monthers. You see that child there looking like she's in a hairdryer from Mars. It's actually a MEG machine, an MEG machine. Um, that takes a movie, an actual movie, of the child's brain in action. So um, in this particular experiment by Patricia Kuhl at the University of Washington, uh, children uh, were put into the MEG machine. It doesn't hurt them. It's non-invasive. Um, and um, then they just played with their mothers or their fathers as they usually did. And what uh, Pat found was it wasn't just the auditory part of the brain that lit up. It was the Broca area of the brain. Um, that part on the left that's in green, um, that's responsible for, rehear for um, be being able to speak. So even before the child has any words, they're just saying ma, 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 da, 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 um, that child is rehearsing um, the language, um, in this case, that she needs to speak. Um, so it's really important that we talk to babies. Uh, I was on a, on a, a website um, um, a, a texting uh, um, site recently for my grandson, and they um, they uh, were not talking about talking um, to children who were babies. Um, it was, the focus was on talking to children after they began to talk. So um, this is really important um, that the the image that we have of the brain as a sponge is not accurate. Um, the brain is built for action. Um, it's not a sponge. It's not just absorbing. But that child is simulating um, in, in her, her brain the actions that she will need to, to do to speak, almost like Pat Cool uses the analogy of someone skiing down a slope, um, that you're, you're watching it, how it's done before you do it. Um, the fourth important strategy that we found um, is executive functions. Now, one of my board members said that that sounds like um, a, a guy with a um, – um, a pinstripe suit, some, some boss in your brain with a pinstripe suit on, executive function sounds a little forbidding. But that's the term uh, that is used to describe uh, very important brain functions that happen. Um, they, they refer to the um, neurocognitive processes, and they are bringing together our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities to achieve goals. We tend to se separate out social, emotional, and cognitive, the brain doesn't work that way, particularly um, when we're achieving goals. We bring together our behavior, our, our, our thoughts, our actions, and emotions to achieve goals. And study after study has shown that the children who have good executive function skills 
are much more likely to do well now and in the future. Many, many studies show that, that this is um, executive functions are the how we learn, content is the what we learn. And we need to focus on how, not just what, when we're talking about learning. In the journey that I did looking at executive functions, I found that there were actually seven skills that were based on executive functions and that they, and that they promoted them. And these skills uh, at, at their core, um, the brain processes that are important are working memory, being able to remember the information that you have so that you can use it. Flexibility, that is being able to respond to what's going on in the moment. And inhibitory control, that means that you're able to stop what you're doing um, and do what you need to do to achieve a goal. If you want to lose weight, it's not having that chocolate dessert, for example. Um, inhibitory control. Now, I know this is complicated, um, and if you go to our website, mindinthemaking.org, um, you'll find lots of papers about executive function uh, that describes it. Um, the skills that I found are, that are important are focus and self-control, that's being able to pay attention and, um, and weed out distraction, and also to... Um, have the self-control that you need to achieve goals. Perspective taking is beyond empathy. It includes empathy, but it means understanding what someone else feels and thinks, um, which is really critical to doing well in school and in life. Um, in school, the kids who are better able to understand what their teacher expects and what other kids expect tend to do uh, better. And in life, I always think of Admiral Mike Mullen, who was the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when he went to another country, when he was chair um, uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, crossing all military um, uh, groups in this country, he didn't ask the usual, get the usual briefing about what is it like in Afghanistan. He asked how would someone who grew up in this country think and feel about everyday situations. And I think he did so well in his job because he really took that perspective to understanding. Uh, communicating is is not, it's, you could think of it as the elevator speech in a sense. It's knowing what you want to say and knowing how it will be heard so that it can be understood. So you can see that it involves the ability to pay attention, to understand other people's perspectives, and have the self-control to say what you need to say to convince other people. Making connections is at the heart of all learning. Um, it involves, uh, if you think about learning, it involves symbolic connections. In other words, the letter on this slide uh, stand for things, and you understand the words that they stand for, um, that is making a connection. Making unusual connections is creativity, which is critical in a world where you can Google for information. Critical thinking is just what it sounds like, being able to understand what's valid and accurate information in a world where we've gone from um, where truth is what you can make up, um, where truthiness has become a word. Um, during this election cycle, I kept thinking, uh, how important it is to um, really make sure that the children that with whom we pa the pa children we parent, the children we teach, the children we care for, uh, all of us learn critical thinking. Taking on challenges is more than resilience. It means trying that next hard thing. It's getting on that bike when you fall off. Um, it's trying the thing that scares you. And it all leads to being able to set goals where you're a self-directed and engaged learner. Um, so these are the life skills that we have found in mind in the making are most important. So what have we done with this? We've developed um, uh, training for community leaders. Um, you just heard about it in Las Vegas, and you probably didn't know what it was. Um, what we do is we go to a community or a state, and we bring together, um, and states are composed of communities. So if we're going to a state like New Hampshire or Oregon, we bring together people in communities around the states. Uh, we bring together about 30 or so people who are the community leaders across systems. Um, like Sherry talked about the importance of partnerships, we bring together those people who are the community leaders. And by doing so, by having them go through this training, which is very personal, um, you talk about the skills in yourself. You, it focuses on the adult first and then the child, um, and it uses video and real life experience um, as a way of learning. Uh, but by, by learning with people across systems, it creates uh, better partnerships and better ways of working together in communities. We also uh, redefine parent engagement. We don't have the parents learning this um, from uh, experts. We have the parents and professionals learning this together um, so that they can set goals for the children in their care um, and whom they teach. So uh, we're in about 20 learning communities in 16 different states and two more states that have come on board in 2016 and more to come. 
um, room takes uh, this scientific knowledge and it condenses it um, in some cases to 250 to 300 word sound bites. Um, I mean, um, characters, not sound bites, characters. Um, and, that, um, and that we take the everyday moments that families are in um, or caregivers are in with children, whether you're waiting for a bus, um, whether, we, um, whether we, um, you're giving your child a bath, it's the time that you already have, um, whether you're doing a, an everyday routine, and turn it into brain-building moments. And then there's a brainy background. And you can see on the first, uh, the green slide um, of an app, it's a, an app that you can download, um, that you, um, there's a tip and there's the brainy background, but you can pick your own. Um, and you can even write your own, and you can get tip card sets. Uh, but Vroom is translating the science in the third to fifth grade uh, language. Um, someone asked about how you can find about um, Mind in the Making um, Institutes for Facilitators. Um, Jana asked about that. And um, Aaron can let you know uh, when these are coming up. Um, we, and communities that are interested, please be in touch with Aaron Ramsey because um, she can um, help you organize one for your community. They've, they um, are most often called transformational. Um, here's, uh, we've had uh, with a daily room, uh, we've had about um, these tips downloaded and um, the app downloaded in 100 countries with over 100,000 direct engagements. Um, and um, we also have created take home Friday tips um, that teachers uh, can stick in, their, in the kids' backpacks uh, for over the weekend, fun things that you can do um, with your child. Um, so these can be translated in all different kinds of ways. Um, we also um, have um, worked with First Book and also Raising a Reader. Uh, we picked a library of 89 books that have free tip sheets. Uh, we've had almost a half a million downloads of these tip sheets. The books are books that promote, promote executive function skills. And um, yes, everything is available in Spanish and English, everything we've done. Um, and um, uh, these can be downloaded. So if you're going to read um, a book like The Carrot Seed, or um, we have a, uh, a library that goes up from birth through kids who are 12 years old, and um, they all are uh, around very diverse cultures. Um, the tips are in Spanish and English, and a half a million people have downloaded them. You can find them on our tip sheets. Um, and yes, they're all free. Um, New Hampshire and Oregon, uh, and uh, Oregon are statewide uh, this month. But again, we're uh, enthusiastic about coming to your communities. Uh, and uh, our, our point of taking Mind in the Making, which was developed by the Families and Work Institute, and moving to it to the Bezos Family Foundation, is that we can do these things either for free or, or at absolute minimum cost. So um, that was our, um, one of our purposes of, of going there. Um, so prescriptions for learning take the everyday que questions that parents have and teachers have. Um, my kid won't eat, um, screen time, uh, bedtime, fussy, uh, fussy, um, fussy children, siblings fighting. Uh, we took the most frequently asked questions, and we've used research to translate them into prescriptions for learning. Our real thrust is to uh, take the things that pe people might see as challenges. We're trying to to create a mindset shift here. The things that people see as challenges, as the tough issues, as bad behavior, as, as discipline problems, and turn them into opportunities to create life skills. And these, will be, um, these are on the web and, and available for downloading. So what's our theory of change? There are 10 tenets to it um, that are a theory of change. First is uh, we have a two-generational or three or four-generational approach. Um, we never start with kids. We start with the adults. We feel very strongly that unless we have these skills um, that we can't really promote them um, uh, in, in, uh, with other children. And we were asked about uh, translating them to other languages. And uh, yes, uh, Vroom, uh, people uh, who were using Vroom, for, uh, for instance, in South King County, um, where there was a community-wide effort to use Vroom, translated them to all of the 50-some languages in their community. We ask that you not change the content because it's research approved, uh, uh, researcher approved, but you're welcome to translate them uh, yourselves. Um, um, so, um, the second thing is, um, we 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 walk what we talk. Um, in other words, we have principles of that we've learned from brain science that we use to promote uh, these life skills. That are, that are based on executive functions. So we believe that people learn experientially. Our teaching is very much experiential. We, we believe in the importance, we find the importance of scaffolding in so much of the literature. 
we don't it's not just sit in the room and, and write down information like I'm doing for you now, but when we're actually out in communities working, it's very much um, building on what the group is doing um, and scaffolding that to new experiences. So we have a set of principles of engaged learning that we rate each other on. Um, we provide adults with experiences of actual research, of child development research that uh, can be used. Um, so um, that um, um, this is a still face experiment. For those of you who don't know it, if the adult stops talking to um, a child, the child will do anything to try to get the adult engaged. And if you do this with a group of um, adults, the same thing will happen. If you ask a group of adults to stop speak, it's one person to say something that's important and another person to not respond. You can see the adults in the room going crazy. Um, we very much depend on those nonverbal cues from and verbal cues from each other. And to make this point of how our face looks, how our bodies look, uh, the words we say, what difference they make in communicating, we share this as an experience before we share the research that's done by Edtronic. We're not uh, preachy teachy. We are uh, very much inspired. Okay, that's the one adorable picture of my grandson that has to be on every presentation. Uh, Aaron and I have uh, grandchildren uh, rights in, in, in our materials. We hope you do too children or grandchildren. Uh, we take the hot issues um, that are debated and we uh, share research by, by bringing science to bear. For example, a Stephanie Carlson's study there, we have videos of all this research. Stephanie Carlson's research um, has uh, shown that if kids pretend, you know, there's a debate about pr the importance of uh, pretend play. If kids pretend, they're much more likely to be able to persist at a, a, a task much uh, longer. That child is pretending to be Batman. Um, that's true for adults. If we think of someone we admire, we're able to do uh, harder things. Um, Phil Zalazzo's research is showing that if we have a chance to, to think about the mistakes we make and learn from them, um, we are much more likely to learn things and their actual changes in our brains. Um, most of school is built on the question, answer, question, answer without really looking at uh, mistakes and, and how to learn from them. Clancy's Blair uh, research shows that, um, that these, the precursors of executive functions start very early in the relationships that we have with children, particularly relationships where we're supportive, where we're scaffolding um, with other people. Um, uh, Larry Aber talks about how if we teach perspective taking, it reduces conflict in school. And Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, Roberta Golenkoff, and Lauren Adamson show that it's not the quantity of words that children hear. If you hear about the 30 million word debate, it's that back and forth, what they call a conversational duet, that back and forth that really determine um, learning. Um, we use games. Uh, we believe that and if um, people won't learn very well if there's not a child intervention, if we just do adult interventions. So we're going to be partnering with Tools of the Mind, and we partnered with Megan McClellan and her Circle Time Games. These are games that promote executive function skills, like red light, green light, but um, done in a way that um, you can see that this is in the picture. It's touch your head. Um, and if the, if the adult says touch your head, the kids are supposed to do the opposite and touch your toes. Um, that has in, um, uh, Megan's and her colleagues' research has been found to improve executive function skills right now and in the future, that kids are also improving in literacy and in numeracy skills. Um, that's why the executive function skills are so important. We use a research-tested way of bringing about change, Gabriel Oettingen, that shows that just thinking positively uh, is, doesn't lead to positive results. In fact, it's more likely to lead to ne negative results. You lose energy if you just think about what you want to achieve in life. Um, you're, not, you're less likely to achieve it. So um, that, that is really an important um, a me measure that we use. We help people think of the obstacles and how to overcome them. Um, so we uh, try to create a community surround uh, like this information is in the water and in the air with all of the materials that we have. Um, and we're working with sectors. We take a community surround approach to working with different sectors. For example, we've worked in community schools um, um, because we think that um, we shouldn't stop just with early childhood. We should uh, go through uh, birth through eight. Um, we've worked with healthcare professionals um, in a world where people can go to the drugstore for shots and Google um, medical information online. Medicine knows that it has to change, particularly pediatrics. And we are really reforming medicine, working in partnership with Mount Sinai. We've adapted the modules to be used. Pediatricians will get three years of training.
training in child development research. They, they'll use prescriptions for learning. They'll be able to text parents responses to the questions that they ask. And rather than waiting rooms, we're going to have room rooms. We're also working, um, we've worked with museums and libraries. This book, uh, this report is, uh, that we did in conjunction with IMLS is free and available online. Great ideas for museums and libraries of, of what you can do to translate this research. And we've also developed training with the Boston Children's Museum that adapts this training for museums and libraries. Um, Aaron just was in Marin County doing this. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about what we've done with the Children's Museum of Denver because you're going to hear about that directly from Denver, but really excited um, to, um, to use Vroom in the places uh, that are kind of dead space in the museums like along the walls or chairs, uh, stairs, or in bathrooms. Uh, we're working uh, with home visiting. Uh, where we're translating, um, working with Every Child Succeeds, translating Mind in the Making and Vroom uh, to be a regular part of home visiting. Particularly important is um, the creating these skills in home visitors who are often burned out by the jobs that they have. Um, we're working with brands. So when you buy shampoo um, you, um, or um, get diapers or so forth, uh, you will get tips um, on the packaging. Um, Goya has actually put them on their products. So um, on Goya products, you're going to get tips, brain building tips um, on products. And we've worked with Wish and Poof, um, a, a, an Amazon series, um, to incorporate this into television shows and are working with even more series in the future. Um, we've done an evaluation. Um, Ready to Learn Providence has brought um, Mind in the Making um, to everyone, uh, all, the, all the families of children entering uh, preschool, uh, pre-K, and uh, they've trained uh, right now about 1,500 um, parents and about 500 professionals, but they include uh, the, the receptionists, the, the teacher's aides, not just the teachers. And in Evansville, we've done um, research evaluation that have shown that in just six weeks of training, we're able to improve parents' executive function skills and children's executive function skills, particularly among the kids who had lowest executive function skills to begin with. And we leveled the playing field in math. The kids' um, um, math scores uh, were equivalent of, uh, became equivalent to kids with higher executive function skills. Um, so um, thank you so much. Um, and now I'm... Um, back to a question. Yeah, thank you so much, Ellen. And again, if you've got any questions, um, please pop them in the box. I think Ellen did a great job of trying to merge them in as she was going through. But what's your sense of this? Do you have internal systems for professional development or an early childhood and brain development? Um, just to try to get a sense of the audience, because this is a, a great actionable way to do that across partners, um, giving strong content, and actually leaving both adults and children um, with what to do next, which is really, you know, a, a triple winner. So we are seeing that um, about two-thirds of the group, I think, um, does have um, internal professional development. And so I imagine you might be able to melt this in, about a third not having um, internal professional development. Again, that's why these partnerships and bringing people together can create access to what you don't have in either a smaller institution or an institution that's not investing in this kind of professional development. And about 12% are unsure. But we really do encourage you to reach out. Aaron's contact information is at the end. Um, if you want to know how to bring this kind of training and information to your community, uh, if you want to learn more about the toolkit and creating a table, um, you'll have my contact information as well. So with that, we're going to hear another local example. And Julia? Yes. Yes, thank you so much, Sherry. This is Julia Bland. I'm the CEO of the Louisiana Children's Museum in New Orleans, and we have long been admirers and followers of Mind in the Making research. Um, the, room, the room tools and tips that can be used. But we spent about a year and a half incorporating the, the seven essential life skills in a program that the museum delivers on a daily basis into public schools. We have that, the program embedded, and, and it's been there. It actually started as a post-Katrina po program that was designed to last three months um, working to build resiliency skills with children 
over the years we've changed it, strengthened it, and now are very proud of the work that is aligned with Mind in the Making. Um, over the course of the last decade, we have worked with over 16,000 children on a weekly basis in our region um, in, in public schools. So the next three slides are actually from an overview, that um, a documentation that we did last year to show the alignment with our play-based, um, imagination-based, literacy-based program in the schools as they're tied to, to the seven essential life skills. At the top right, you're going to see not only the page number of our documentation book, but also which skills are being highlighted and encouraged um, in our interactive experiences. Um, it is a program that is nine months long. It is delivered um, daily in our public schools. We actually have some of the high-risk children, the most high-risk, most vulnerable children who are participating in this. And to be able to see the impact of this, um, of what they're learning, what they're experiencing, how they're able to, to problem solve, to identify feelings, to communicate, and to reference the skills as, as they're processing throughout the play-based um, program, Play Power, is pretty extraordinary. This documentation aims at capturing the images of daily life in the Play Power schools and the programs, but it also aims to, to really make visible the, the words, the thinking process of the children. So it is the words they're using, it's the, it's the imagery they're, draw, they're using to draw, to diagram, um, what, how they're problem solving or how they're feeling, what their emotions are. In this particular example, there was a girl that had a, a red dot on her nose, and, and our, our staff went through. Um, the whole class ended up putting red dots on their noses and feeling much better about their, um, their, themselves. Um, the perspective taking of her embarrassment turned into real joy throughout the class. Um, but this is, this is something we're so indebted to the work and the research of Ellen and her team and, um, and have loved incorporating this in, in this nine-month program that the museum does. It is a, it's a different type of program because um, we're with the kids on a daily basis. They have, um, they have weekly uh, lessons that are delivered. And so unlike most museum programs where we, we see our visitors for a short period of time, this, is, this gives us a chance to really build to build trust, to build relationships, to get to know the individual children. The participants are as young as kindergartners and as old as third graders. So we have a, a nice span of ages. Julia, I know everybody wants to know, is this increasing your visitorship at the museum? Are you able to connect to families through connecting to the children, or is that work still yet to be done? It does, it's raised our visibility in the community, and I think that, that people don't necessarily think about um, this deeper dive that a children's museum can do. They think more about a physical destination that is for entertainment. And, and this has opened the eyes of how play can, can be, is, is a learning process and a, and a family engagement. Um, so it's diversifying the attendance at the museum, Sherry. It's also allowing people who understand and have followed this program to see the value of children's museum programs embedded in, in the community. Right, and I just can't help it. And so how do you manage the cost? Because you talked about going to children who you know, may have been excluded for, because of where they live or what their parents know but then there's a cost for going to Children's Museum. So have you managed that um, challenge? The, the, cost, the cost for the Play Power program is, uh, has been underwritten. We've actually had a number of different donors over the years. Currently it's supported by the, the Kellogg Foundation, uh, who is very focused on vulnerable children in, in their earliest years. Um, the cost to the museum, the access to the museum is something we're very committed to making um, accessible, free of charge, or discounted, and a good 25% of our admission through the front door is either free or discounted. That, that is, and then we have a number of programs that are delivered 
totally free of charge in the community at Head Start centers or certainly this one in public schools. Thank you so much. So let's do this question. Do you see opportunities in your current work to scaffold the life skills or the executive function skills that Ellen uh, was talking about and Julia gave us an example and the research? Are you seeing those opportunities in your current work? So, yes, you're already doing it. Yes, you could imagine doing it in the future. No, or not sure. And let's get a sense of what we're discovering. Um, so about 40%, 35% of folks um, are already doing that. Um, there's about half of you who said, yes, you could imagine doing it in the future. And that's really critical, and a part of us doing this webinar is to link you with resources that help you do that because we realize there's a lot of information flowing quickly about the development of young children, and I think what Ellen and Bezos and the Work Family Institute has done has made it more accessible um, and give you a place to start with implementing and integrating it. So would love to hear from the 50% of you. Um, and you may not be the authority to make the decision, but you can certainly make the inquiry, and we're always happy to reach out to others that can advance the work. So thank you for uh, participating in that. And now I'll turn it over to another local example from Sarah. Hello. How's the sound? Can everybody hear me okay, other presenters? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you and and if you can't, people should let us know in the chat box. Wonderful. Thanks so much. I was on mute for long enough that I thought it might have, it's like when you cross, if you have your eyes crossed long enough for your parents, it'll stick that way. Like that's what I thought might be happening. So hello and thank you so much for allowing me to spend a few minutes talking about the way that the Children's Museum of Denver at Marsico campus is integrating some of this research into our environment and our practice and what a privilege it is to have an opportunity to really, as a children's museum and as a free choice learning uh, center in the community, to be able to come closer to the essential work that's being done around early childhood. It is um, really exciting for us. So just a little bit of background, as both Sherry and Julia emphasized, museums have unique affordances and assets, museums, libraries, non-formal learning environments um, across our communities. And we feel that while we don't have some of the assets of formal education or of social service and direct service providers, in that you get to see families day in and day out, you have consistency and you have relationships, we have novelty and joy, and we're also extraordinarily well positioned to help adult influencers realize their potential as brain builders and to help them understand the crucial nature of relationships and of interactions. I used to joke that being a children's museum, we are not a collections-based institution. We don't have a, a, you know, a valuable collection in our underground storeroom, um, but that children were our collection. And then someone told me that that actually sounds really creepy. Um, but what I mean by that is that for a long time, I would say that as a children's museum, the purpose of our exhibits and programs and labels and prompts and cues and signage was to provide platforms for children's action and agency and to reveal children's innate creativity and power, that we were really um, an invitation or an environment for that. But now I've refined that, and I think I've come to a better and, and, and more interesting understanding that our essence is really a platform for interactions between children and adults. Like many institutions in the field of children's museums, we made a pivot away from a child focus to a family learning focus. And that's where I'm going to talk a little bit about our partnership with uh, Mind in the Making and with Room. So a little bit about us. We're in the city of Denver, Colorado, and we serve uh, the region largely. We are early childhood focused, and last year we served just over half a million visitors. Um, we recently comp completed a big campus expansion that allowed us to open our doors to even more uh, families and children, and that was where we made the decision that we really wanted to emphasize 
uh, parent and caregiver engagement. And I was familiar with the work of Mind in the Making and participated in a facilitator training um, recently about that and was really excited for the potential of integrating brain development and executive function in the flow, the fluid, the playful interactions that take place in a children's museum. And so as I start to show the next two or three slides that are images of our current project, um, I should say that one, our work specifically with Vroom is grounded in two things. One, the state of Colorado is launching a rollout of Vroom um, across many of our early childhood partners and that that effort is championed by um, an organization called Parent Possible. They're our anchor partner here in Colorado and they are helping to oversee the integration and rollout of Vroom in early childhood education settings, home visiting settings, um, and across the early childhood ecosystem. And we were thrilled to be working in alignment with that. The second way that we're anchored in this work is we had an opportunity through our partnership with the Bezos Family Foundation to take on this idea of bringing Vroom into the museum as a pilot for the field of museums and libraries, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So this image shows um, some of the graphic installation that we've recently done, taking the messages and parent tips from Vroom, which is grounded in the research um, explicated so fully by Mind in the Making, and integrating that into the museum experience. And so there are three big principles that helped us as the museum team was working with the Bezos Family Foundation, um, as well as the creative agency, Johannes Leonardo, on this sort of visual look and feel, this iconography and this visual identity. Number one was to go with the flow. We recognize that as a free choice learning environment, uh, families and children are, there's lots of stimuli, there's lots going on. People come with different motivations. You've got to be watching your kids and, you know, getting bubble solution on you and, you know, doing a painting. There's a lot going on. And so we really wanted all of the signage and all of the prompts to really meet families where they were at. And so what you're seeing here is the image of a sign out in our sort of entryway coming from our parking lot, walking up the sidewalk. And then another uh, graphic installation, which is right inside the big main doors of the museum, in which we welcome parents and families and we introduce this idea of room. And then knowing that when you're in a children's museum, very rarely are parents kind of kicking back with like time on their hands to read the newspaper or, or check their email. We know that children need to be engaged all the time in order for families to feel safe and comfortable, which is a prerequisite for being able to learn. And so for that signage with parents where it says, hola los padres, you'll see the, the goggles underneath where kids and families can look out onto our outdoor exhibit. And so the idea was that we would be given a quick tidbit or an aside to the adults while engaging the children in something interesting and then inviting the parents to come alongside them and practice those contingently responsive serve and return back and forth interactions. So the next principle that informed this graphics installation of room messaging at the museum was to focus on the everyday. And so we as a museum pride ourselves on having some really rich, educational, inspiring learning environments in our exhibits and our programs. But what we realized is that we wanted to help emphasize the message that every moment is a learning moment and that parents and adult caregivers have a chance to be a brain builder you're in the spaces in between. It's not something that has to happen in an expertly designed environment like a museum. It can happen anywhere. And so we selected all of our amenity spaces, as Ellen called them, kind of the dead spaces in the museum. Um, and so it's places like our stairwells and our drinking fountains and our changing tables and our bathrooms. We wanted to bring those to life, those sort of moments in between. And then finally, really giving adults clear ideas about the role that they could play. 
while we come from a strengths-based perspective for both children and adults, we believe that they are strong and rich in assets, that every adult wants the absolute best for the child that they love. At the same time, research in the field suggests that parents and caregivers don't always know exactly what their role can be in terms of facilitating learning or interacting with their children at different ages and stages, especially in a really open-ended environment like a children's museum. And so the tips and the messages that we crafted with the Bezos Family Foundation really gave parents guidance and ideas uh, to inspire them to action. And as Ellen said earlier, we inspire rather than teach or preach. And so I don't know if you can see the dad who's at the changing table, but he is grinning broadly. And so we try to inject a dose of humor. We try to talk in a conversational tone to parents in these, in these messages. And then finally, in addition to the kind of static graphics installation, those, those vinyl and those decals, are all over the museum, they're unfacilitated. We also have done a number of introductory events introducing Vroom and this joint museum Vroom messaging to our community. And so what you're seeing here is one of our um, dramatic play spaces at the Children's Museum of Denver. And you can see that there's a trifold sign that includes um, an image, sort of an inspirational play modeling image, and then a tip for families and Spanish, and the brainy background. And then you can see those orange uh, folded sheets. Those were passports. This is an event that we did where families were invited and we provided transportation for them to come to the museum and learn a little bit about Vroom. And they had these passports to go around and visit these different Vroom stations throughout the museum. You can also see the Vroom tip cards there on the table. And so as part of this, we've done a really extensive training with our frontline museum staff educating them in executive function, in early childhood brain development, and most importantly, in a really positive and validating approach to communicating with parents and caregivers. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, really appreciate that. Um, and another question, our last question is, are you using non-traditional spaces to promote brain building moments? Um, that's such a unique idea that, that Sarah offered, and I just wondered how many other um, folks are either thinking about that in the future, um, doing it now. And so here we go. We've got about 25% that are doing it now, but about 63% interested in doing it in the future. And I think the ready-made tools that Ellen um, offered earlier in the webinar are a perfect start to be able to have the right resources. With that, we have a couple minutes for questions. I don't know, Erin, um, did anything pop up for you, Ellen, Sarah, Julia, Danielle, any last thoughts? This is Erin. Um, I, I think what just kept coming to my mind as all of these wonderful presentations uh, were being delivered is how important museums and libraries are in the community and how um, they're, so, they're positioned to take so many different types of leads, like in Las Vegas and Denver and in Louisiana. So I really want to thank our colleagues for, for highlighting the work that they're doing. And I also want to reiterate that those of you that can imagine this in the future or that are interested in the future, I would be so happy to talk with you individually and see where you are and, and where you want to go. I think the exciting thing is we're really we're, we're we're on the front end of how we can implement this phenomenal resource the resources and the research and there is so much more to be done and very publicly shared with museums and libraries and and larger communities of early learning and early childhood. So thank you thank you all for all the work you've done and shared with us. Yeah, and we had a question in the chat box um are libraries or museums able to get the room decals for their library? Is that something you all have available? Let me chime in. This is Sarah at the Children's Museum of Denver. And so the decals were um, part of a pilot project, and they are currently proprietary um, to, the, to the creative agency that helped develop them. But we are working with the Bezos Family Foundation to make those available as, as a low-cost 
um, intervention that many different institutions could purchase and replicate because the idea was that it would be something that would be universal. Everybody's got a bathroom. Everybody's got a, you know, a, a changing table or those kind of things. So stay tuned, and uh, the Bezos Family Foundation is going to be sharing availability about those hopefully in the, in the near future, the next six months or so. We actually, this is Ellen, and we actually have a store where um, you can get things like the, the tip cards and, and um, the, the app you can download for free. Um, on our website you can get prescriptions for learning and you can get um, the book tips for free and just download them. But there's, they will be in a store, um, so that, and um, our commitment is to do things that cost. So it's simply the cost of producing them, not um, be, because our purpose is to make this, these materials available. Again, again um, that's our mission, that's our purpose, is to make them available and, and have as few barriers to um, people being able to use them as possible. We, we also had another question about the webinar. And yes, you'll receive the PowerPoint and you'll receive a recording so that you can slow it down and listen to it and catch some more of the tidbits if you're interested, or of course share it with your other colleagues. We really do want you to be able to share this information um, with others. But as Aaron said, I think you should feel free to reach out to she or I. Um, we're both on this last slide here with our emails, um, place for you to get the toolkit so that we can individually direct you as needed um, or as you desire to keep your work going. We really appreciate the time you've given us today and um, want to maybe be able to give you a few minutes back um, if there are no other questions. Erin, are we good? Yeah, I think we are. And I appreciate everybody joining us and all the presentations were fabulous and I look forward to all the possibilities. Um, Aaron, could we and add the brain building toolkit, um, the brain building um, book to the final slide so that people could easily find out where to get that? Because it's got ideas from museums and libraries all over the country of really cool things they're doing. Yeah, we can add the link definitely. Great. And then if everybody visits mindinthemaking.org, it's right on the home page, um, and you can download it directly from there too. And the BUILD initiative wants to be really uh, appreciative of the Institute for Museum and Library Science for supporting us to do this project. And I'm also really appreciative of our partners at the Bezos Foundation and the long-term relationships with Aaron and Ellen and our friends across the country, Julia and others. We really have met some fabulous people on the ground doing the work and want to continue to be informed by that. So thank each of you, Danielle, Miriam, Aaron, Ellen, Sarah, um, for joining us today and sharing your ideas. Uh, we look forward to working with each of you on the call and building good things in your neighborhoods and communities. And thank you, Sherry and Build, for the amazing things you're doing in, in creating an early childhood system. Thank you. And it's our working yeah. together, uh, I think, that's going to make the difference in the end. So enjoy the evening. Happy holidays to everyone, and enjoy the extra 12 minutes in your day. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Ellen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.